Good morning and welcome to Worship at Forks of the Brandywine. We're glad you can join us this morning. And if you're visiting with us for the first time, we're glad you're here with us also. Uh, as we continue our uh, being separated from one another in worship, uh, we continue to hope and pray that uh, the time is short when we'll be able to gather together once again, um, practicing social distancing, of course. The call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. Come, let us worship the Lord. Our opening hymn this morning is, is number 137, I have to say it, but you will have received the, uh, uh, the song in your email. So let's stand and sing with joy. Oh, how I love Jesus. Recite with me our confession of faith, the Apostles' Creed, which we should have included in the email. Church, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will you pray with me, please? And Father God, we come before you this morning and we thank you for the opportunity to gather and to worship you. 
And Father, we're reminded of the fact that even though we are separated physically, we are all united in the love and the crying out to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so, Father, regardless of where we are this morning, we all come and approach your throne of grace to bring you honor and glory that is due to you and no one or nothing else. We pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom, that you would guide us during these difficult times, that you would help us to see, Father, ways in which we can change our lifestyles to become more and more sold out to Jesus. Teach us, Father, to understand the significance of what it means to look around and see others who are less fortunate than we are. Give us a heart of Jesus to long after those people who are lost, to bring them into your household through your Holy Spirit, to touch them, Father, physically if needed, to provide nutrients to them, to give them the things that we are able to do, all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, as we continue in these uh, uh, times of restrictions and constraints, we are reminded of the fact that in Christ Jesus, we are free, we are free indeed. And that there's no one and nothing that can keep us from worshiping you and calling upon your holy name. And we know, Lord, that you hear our prayer and you know that you love us because you have sent your son. And we thank you in his name and we pray the prayer he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is our tradition at the Forks to stand for the reading of God's holy word. And I'm going to ask you to do that wherever you are this morning. Uh, the reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of St. Matthew. And it's found in chapter 16 beginning at verse 13. Hear the words of the Lord. They're inerrant, infallible, and inspired. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. May the Lord has a blessing to the reading of his word. Pray with me. Father, as we have your, heard your word this morning, we ask that your spirit would bring it into our lives in such a way that we would live it. Teach us what you would have us to learn from this passage. Help us to use it in a way that pleases you and brings glory to you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The year is somewhere around 29 AD. Um, Jesus and his apostles have been doing their public ministry in the area of Galilee. And they have been roaming the countryside, performing miracles, preaching the good news of the gospel, and drawing many to, to God himself. Um, as they're headed back, they're now heading back into what is often called the, uh, the retirement ministry of Jesus. It's the last few months of his public ministry on earth. And as they're coming back, they're coming back into an area around Sidon and Tyre. Um, from the perspective of the modern world, 
Uh, Tyre would be known today as the southern border of Lebanon, uh, about 12 kilometers from Israel, and Sidon uh, would be on the other side of that, uh, probably about 25 kilometers from Israel. But they're both in what we consider modern day Syria and Israel. And as the apostles are walking back, talking with Jesus, Jesus is asking them a couple of questions. And he's asking them the question that has been asked throughout all of Jesus' public ministry. Who are the people saying that I am? And he's asking them that because he wants to see, after two years of ministry with him, what their feelings are about him. And so some say that, uh, well, he's Elijah. And Elijah was supposed to come back, according to Jewish tradition, he was supposed to be brought back to life at the time and be become the Messiah. And so they called him Elijah. Some say, no, it was John the Baptist who was gonna be brought back to life and fulfill the requirements of the Messiah. And some said, no, Jeremiah. And it was thought that Jeremiah had actually taken the articles for the, from the temple and hid them in a cave until such a time as they would restore uh, offerings uh, in, in the Jewish culture through their religion. And Jesus is walking and hearing what these apostles are saying. And what's happening is none of these people are right. And so Jesus turns to the apostles and he says to them, but who do you say that I am? And I want you to pay attention. We're not big on grammar in America. Um, some of us who are older had to go through a lot of grammar in elementary school. Some of you remember diagramming sentences and all of that stuff. Uh, not a fun time in my life, but I remember the grammar when Jesus is asking them, who do you say I am? And the who do you say I am? The you is a plural. So he's not just asking Peter, he's asking all of the apostles. Sometimes I think we get a bad understanding of Jesus just talking to Peter, and that's not the case. What he is saying is, all of you apostles, who do you say I am? And then of course, Peter answers. And it's not unusual for Peter to answer, Peter answered for them on a lot of different occasions. Uh, in Matthew 19, 27, Peter answered him. Peter answered Jesus. We have left everything to follow you. What will there be for us? And Jesus replies to them that they will receive much for what they have given up. Uh, so Peter is oftentimes seen as the spokesman for the apostles, and that's the case here. And he says to Jesus, thou art the Christ. And I wanna focus on that for a few minutes. With that statement, thou art the Christ, Peter is announcing his understanding that Jesus is the Messiah. Christ was the term, the anointed one, was the term that was used uh, mostly by the Greeks and the Romans. The Jewish people would have used the term Messiah. But either way, the anointed one or the Messiah was one with a special mission coming uh, to earth to save the people from their sins. And so as Jesus is uh, listening to Peter and understanding what, he's be what is being said, Peter is now calling him and laying this out. And he says, thou art the Christ. You are the anointed one. And with that comes a lot of terminology and a lot of definition and description of who Jesus is. And so when he declares Jesus to be Christ, the long-awaited one, we're reminded of the passage uh, about the Messiah in Isaiah 7, 14. And that reads, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel calling Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, is the beginning of the process of understanding Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. In, in the process of calling him the anointed one, we run into several different descriptions of Jesus. First of all, he's true man, flesh and blood, 
as Isaiah predicted almost 600 years before his birth. He had to become true man, 100% flesh and blood, otherwise he would not have been able to represent us as human beings. He was called the mediator, and he was the mediator by the Father. And so in Romans 5.10 we read, For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through life? He was the chief priest. He was the chief prophet. As the prophet, you remember the story of him being taken. He take, uh, takes Peter, James, and John to the Mount of Transfiguration. And as he is lifted up, you see Elijah and you see Moses. Those are the three greatest prophets ever to live. And so he is set up also as the prophet of God. He would be the one to foretell what was happening. Hebrews 6.20 tells us he's also the high priest. So understand what this little simple sentence means when Peter says, thou art the Christ. He's saying that you are the fulfillment of everything the Old Testament speaks about and writes about. You are the fulfillment of all the prophecies of the prophets. You are the fulfillment of the promise in the book of Genesis, uh, in what we call the proto Galion, the first message the first message of the gospel where God tells Adam and Eve that he will send a redeemer. And so he is also our high priest. In 620, it says, where Jesus who went before us has entered on our behalf, he has become a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now we don't know a lot about Melchizedek. We find him in Genesis as Abraham is coming back from war and we know that Abraham gives a portion, a tribute, a tithe of his uh, plunder to Melchizedek. We don't know where he comes from. We don't know where he goes. But we know several things about him that are very exciting, at least to me. First of all, his name is exciting. His name is Melchizedek. Melchi meaning king and Sadiq meaning righteousness. So Melchizedek is the king of righteousness. So he is a foreshadowing of God himself, of Jesus. And it's interesting because where he reigns, his kingdom is called Salem. In Jewish language, that translates to Shalom. So Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, is the king over the kingdom of peace. That is a look at Christ reigning over his people in the end times. And so Peter's comment that thou art the Christ is very fulfilling. The second part of the statement, the son of the living God, is equally as exciting to me. In the son of the living God, he makes a unique statement that nobody else, no other human being can make. He says, you are the son of of the living God. That opens up a great plethora of ideas and descriptions of who Jesus is as the Son of God. First of all, he calls him, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man many times to so, show that he has full and complete human nature. But he is also called the Son of God by those around him to talk about his complete and full divinity. So Jesus was and is and always will be as the Son of God. He is the perfect person to come and to save the people. He represents the people fully in flesh and blood. And that's why the scripture says that he is in all ways tempted like we were. It is extremely important that the person who died represented us totally in flesh and blood. But it's also important that the person who died was God so that he could represent and reconcile us as sinners to himself. And that's what Jesus did. We have the two natures here of God, truly God, or of Jesus, truly God and truly divine. He's also the source of all life. Isaiah 40 says, Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the earth, to the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, 
and her, his understanding no one could fathom. That statement relates back to this whole idea of salvation and how people come to, to become believers and end up going to heaven. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, that leaves no room, folks, for any other person or group to say that they can come to heaven. Jesus himself, the author of truth, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you want to be in heaven, you must know the God of heaven, and you must come to him through Jesus Christ. And finally, the third point is this. Jesus responds to Peter by saying, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. He said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. <clears throat> Those words are critical words because what he is saying is this, that there is no way humanly possible for a person to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You cannot do it. You cannot be smart enough to do it. You cannot deduce it. You cannot induce it. You cannot manipulate it. You cannot be a smart enough scientist to ever come to the conclusion that Jesus is Christ without the work of the Holy Spirit drawing you. It's important for us to understand that this morning because there are many people out there today running around saying there is no hell, heaven may be existing, maybe not, but there is no need to have a personal relationship. But the only way to go to heaven is with that personal relationship between you and Jesus Christ. And there is no way to confess him as Lord and Savior without the work of the Holy Spirit first grabbing you and bringing you to the point of realizing that you are a sinner in need of a savior. And I'm gonna ask you this morning, if you're out there and you've never made a profession of faith, if you never told Jesus that you are a sinner in need of a savior, this might be the very moment to do it. There's nothing elaborate about it. It's you saying, Lord, I am a sinner and I need a savior and I want you to come and to be my savior. It's as simple as that. It's the simplest act you can ever commit. It's the most difficult thing you can ever do. But that is the only way to salvation. And so the comment of Peter speaking for the apostles is you are the Christ, the son of the living God. There is no doubt you are Messiah. In just a few weeks, he is going to go to the cross. And as he dies on that cross, he's going to cry out, it is finished, meaning that not only is his life ended, but more importantly, that his mission to earth has ended. He has come to save all of those that Jesus has called to himself. Pray with me. Thank you, Father, for the words of Peter, and we thank you more for the life of Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you would guide us and direct us and that you would draw those who hear my voice this morning to you through the work of your Holy Spirit. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. For our hymn of response, we're going to sing Christ is Made the Sure Foundation but we're going to sing it to the more familiar tune of Angels from the Realms of Glory.
before I pronounce the benediction, we have a special uh, song this morning that uh, Glenn Kintock has written and Tom Darnell is going to sing. And so I would encourage you after the benediction to hang around and hear this postlude. I may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and be with you both now and forevermore. Go in peace.
Thanks, Glenn and Tom. The uh, song is going to be on our website and on YouTube also, so you'll have a chance to hear it again. Uh, and we'll also have the office mail the uh, lyrics, if that's okay. Thank you, and have a blessed Sunday, and be safe.